for tuning in today. Today I'm going to take you through the steps to make basic bread. We're only going to use five ingredients for this bread, and some of that bread ingredient we're going to be able to interchange with others. I know baking is a science, we are going to use a scientific method for it, however, this is one recipe or one formula that we can mess with the ingredients just a little bit. So with that, let's get started. So today we're going to use 500 grams of bread flour. This is 12.7% gluten content bread flour. Now, a common question is, well, chef, I don't have bread flour just sitting around. Can I use all-purpose flour? You can. You're going to have to use a little bit more, and we can talk about that in another video. But what's nice is you can use these ingredients in multiple recipes and just adding time, temperature, length of proofing, length of primary fermentation, come up with a different dough. So we're gonna walk through that process. The Ten next is water. 10 grams of instant yeast. 10 grams of kosher salt. And 40 milliliters of olive oil. You can, as a substitute, use avocado oil or canola or an oil that you would like to substitute in there. You can even add butter if you would like. So with that, let's get it started. Now the piece of equipment I'm going to use is a, a KitchenAid mixer with a dough hook. However, if you don't have that available, you can use your hands. And if you got a lot of time on your hands and you're stuck at home, it might be just uh, that's what the doctor ordered. So on either side I have the salt, I have the yeast in the center, I'm going to pour in the oil. I'm going to start that and then add my water in. Now, as this starts to mix, I'm just going to add that water, adding all the ingredients. Now, depending on brands of flour, types of flour, it's going to depend on the hydration process. So the hydration will look differently with different types of flour. So a little of this is automatically something you can experience or experiment with. With this dough, with this flour, this happens to be a King Arthur bread flour, it should come out consistent every time. If I was using, like you said earlier, if I was using the all-purpose flour, I'd probably use a little bit more flour and the dough's going to be wetter. And there are certain applications that I might want to do that, um, to have a softer bread or not want to... Um, goes along in the in the primary fermentation so as you can see it's starting to come together looks kind of wet and this is the part where as soon as that dough comes together i want to mark my time and i want to go approximately 12 minutes now 12 minutes is kind of a common time between 10 and 12 minutes i'm actually just going to look for it and i'm going to watch the dough i'm going to watch that the actual bowl is clean it gets cleaned off by the, the friction of that coming around. And what's happening now is the protein called gluten is starting to develop in the bread dough. As that does, there's many videos out there and we can even go through that. And you can see the painting process or actually the elasticity of the dough. And why that's important is you have yeast in there, you have carbohydrates in there. So it's gonna convert the yeast and carbohydrate into carbon dioxide gas. So that's going to form an alcohol. And as that alcohol is formed, those little yeast are in there partying and burping and giving all this gas off. And you need something to capture that gas. And that gluten is what captures that. So if we go all the way back, if you do have a cake or pastry flour, I would absolutely say, no, you can't make bread with that. And there's going to be some people that say, well, you could do this. And like, there's always variables, but as a rule of thumb, there's not enough gluten in there to do that. So you want to stick with your, your bread, bread flour as being the best. So as you can see, this is coming together. It's cleaning the bowl nicely. And as we get into it, it'll just keep going. Now, sometimes it might look a little wet. You may be tempted to add some more flour to it or just dust it in there. Don't do that. Just let it go. Some doughs that you make are going to come out wet. Eat with different with different formulas they'll be wetter but you want that so if you're doing uh, a tabata uh, a fugas, uh different ones that require a wetter dough ones that take very little handling you want something structurally that's going to be wetter 
you wouldn't want a dry, dry dough like a sourdough. Another thing is this is mixing that comes up is people ask about the yeast. And there's three really basic types of yeast. One is a cake yeast. It looks like a pound of butter um, that's gone really bad and has turned quite rubbery. But what's nice, you can just add it in and go. So I like the, the dry instant yeast because it's a real small pellet and you're able to do that. If you use an active dry yeast, you want to hydrate that first. So you put in a little bit of water, let it sit, let it hydrate before you add it and before you start mixing. The other is, I know right now some people are having a shortage on finding yeast. Well, what's nice is anywhere in the air there's yeast and so just for the heck of it, I went ahead and uh, I started my own starter. And all this is, is started it on day one with a 100 grams of water, or 100 milliliters of water, 100 grams of flour, let it sit, covered it up about 12 hours later, let it sit at room temperature. The next day I fed the beast with another 100 and 100, 100 water, or 100 milliliters of water, 100 grams of flour. Next day I only went with 50 and 50 because I don't need to have tons of this stuff. But by day seven, and right now we're at day five, we have already, already have a nice sour smell to it. So if we use this, this is the base for sour dough. And technically, this is a sour dough starter. Now if we keep this alive, we keep feeding the beast, after I use it, replace what I've used, uh, it'll come back and I can use this and this is be one that I can hand down to my granddaughters. So kind of fun that in that process of not having any yeast, I can actually just take the air and harness my own, grow my own and not have to worry about if I'm using instant yeast, fresh yeast or active dry. So as you can see, the stove is really coming together. It's soft in the bowl. The bowl starting to get clean. You can almost see the elasticity. What I'd say is, although it takes a lot of time a lot of muscle to do it by hand it really is fun and kind of critical to your learning to do the actual dough by hand you'll start really feeling the development of the dough and get a real feel for it so it's not just a matter of looking at a clock looking at time looking at temperature all the different things that go into it but you're actually having a feel for it to know when that dough is right and believe it or not you can transfer those skills to other things when you're rolling out doughs to whether or not they have relaxed and you'll start feeling the gluten in different types of doughs that you make. So it's a great skill to pick up. Do chores or if you got some yard work to do, actually I recommend kind of standing next to your mixer. I know it seems arduous, it seems time consuming, but these can walk away, especially if that dough is a little bit dry. So you want to be cautious and just take a little bit of safety to that now as this finishes up sometimes uh, people use a lot of uh, flour and it's certainly a way to do it but uh, i was introduced to um, using oil on your hands and kneading in oil as opposed to kneading in flour both ways are are totally uh, correct sometimes the oil might mess with your ingredient content if you don't have an oil in there I put the oil in there so it has a little bit of uh, one for texture, a little tenderness, and also uh, flavor. And oil is a preservative, so this bread will be good uh, for more than just the day that it's baked or the day after. It'll have a little bit of shelf life to it before it stales out. So I just put a little oil down. As you can see, the dough, the dough is nice and moist, sticky, and again, this is where some people might want to add a lot of flour to it. It's like, oh, it must be too moist. But watch, if we just work it, I'm just taking from the outside, bringing it to the underneath. So you can start seeing just this nice development of gluten got a nice hang to it nice stretch right here I can see that development of that dough but I want it just a little bit more 
So I'd like to just take this, and what I'm doing, I'll try to do it a little slower, is pull from the outside, bring it to the middle, and press down with my palm. Do a turn, a slight turn, pull down. Ultimately, what I'm trying to do is with, if I do this correctly, I should have a nice skin formed on the outside that, uh, that is gonna help trap the gas. If I was to look on the underneath and put it in there, the gas can escape here. We want the best possible skin that we can have for that to hold that gas in. The other thing that I'm feeling for when I press down is if I watch my hand right here, I can actually see the gluten strands breaking. That's a little too rough. I wanna be a little more gentle on that, but I can still tell what the development is. And as I do this, just this little bit from where I started to where I am now, I can tell that it's, it's tacky, it's starting to pick up. It, the strands are more developed and that's right where I wanna to get to. A little more oil. It's gonna be a nice dough. Again, can't substitute the feeling of that dough. It's nice to have that, that mixer, mix up the bulk volume of it. But again, if you don't have it, not a deal breaker. So I have my dough here. I have this perfect container that a friend of mine did some Christmas treats in that works great for my proofing container. So I can put it in the fridge. If I want to just do a, a fast fermentation, I can let it sit at room temperature. But nevertheless, for this one today, I'm just going to let it sit at room temperature for about an hour and a half, two hours until it doubles up and builds volume. We'll check back in a few. Hey, welcome back. This is the part I absolutely love. It's been about an hour and 40 minutes. We're sitting at about 70 degrees. Uh, temperature for room temp. So that kind of gives you a, a little a little indication of where we're at. So this is the part I really like of like opening it up and you can really start smelling what happened. Like with the, the yeast converting that carbohydrate, uh, you can just smell that fermentation. And that's going to give us flavor. Because remember, we only had flour, salt, water, oil, and yeast. That's it. So really you think, well, it can't be that good until I put peanut butter and jelly on it or toast it and put butter on it. Well, that can't be farther from the truth because now that we have that fermentation we have that flavor, we've added that in there. So here's the thing. At this point, when we first put it in here, if we would have put it under refrigeration, we would have retarded the growth of yeast. And that would cause the yeast to slow down, ferment slower, and give us more of an acidic taste. And it also gives us a little bit different texture. We could leave that in the refrigerator for up to 24 to 48 hours, developing, temp developing that flavor. I've also, in the wintertime, just set it outside, covered and everything, and just let it do it naturally. There's something about that I just enjoy doing at home. So with this now, one of the things they say is to punch it down. But remember, we want to be careful with this. This thing has not done anything to us, so why be all violent with it? Also, we worked hard to get the bubbles in, so we don't want to like totally beat it. We want to leave some air in there. But what we want to do is beat it down, so that way it has a chance to grow back up. What that's going to do is it's going to develop more flavor. Also, at this part, we could make a simple pizza dough out of it with just a primary fermentation, but it doesn't have the chew, it doesn't have the elasticity, it doesn't have all the, the characteristics that make a really good pizza pie dough. So this I'm gonna take out, push down the gas, roll it out, put it onto a piece of parchment, cover it with the towel that uh, has a little bit of flour on it, let it sit at room temperature again, until, yep, it doubles in size and then we'll bake it. So a little bit of oil down. Pull out my bread. 
And as you can see, you can see the air bubbles in here. You can see the actual texture of this dough. And it's got this beautiful smell coming off of it. Oh, it's amazing. So I'm just gonna take my bench knife. You can use one of these. You can cut up a piece of plastic. I have this type. So there's a couple different ones. But I just want to round it. This is just rounding the actual dough. I'm getting all the bubbles out. Kind of repeating the process if you see of when I first did it. So on this one, I'm not going to do anything extravagant. We could cut it out into baguettes. We could cut it into a batard or make dinner rolls or, or knots or Kaiser or whatever shape we wanted to do. This one I just want to do in a simple boule, just a round, um, a round loaf. That's it. So we'll put it on here. We have it rounded. Set it on the pan. You can see some bubbles here. That's gas that's trapped under that bread, under that dough, like right here and right here. Those are going to continue to grow. And when I bake them off in the oven, I'm going to bake off about 375 degrees, somewhere in there, maybe take it up to 400, but probably right around 375 degrees. I'm going to throw water in my oven. My wife hates it when I do that, but I'm going to throw water in my oven and that's going to create a steam and help it soften that air for just a little bit. So we get what's called oven spring out of it, where we'll get another rise in the oven as that dough cooks. So we'll cover this, we'll let it rest. I'll come back to you in just a few. You ready? Go. Ah, now isn't that beautiful? You can see the bubbles underneath that crust and those should pop up and be nice and crispy when we're done. So I'm just gonna make a few slashes in it with my razor blade, just to give it a little room to expand, open that up and give it some more raising area. And let's face it, that just looks cool. Now carefully, you can see I have another pan in there set at 375 on convection. That pan right there, that's the one I want to get. Otherwise, I get in trouble from my wife. But we want to get that steam in there so we can get a nice raise on this. Oops, did I accidentally throw some out? Well, we got to get that steam. Now, we'll check back in about 20 minutes and see how it's doing. Beautiful bread. It's gorgeous. I wish you could smell it right here, but one of the things I want to point out real quick, you can see all these little blisters, those little air pockets of gas that developed and be nice and crunchy. And how do we know it's done? Thump it. If it's nice and hollow sounding, you know your bread's done. So I'm gonna put it on the rack here and let this cool. And uh, actually I've been requested to make a sandwich out of this. So that's one heck of a size sandwich. Well, that's it for this video. And I'd like to say just thank you for taking your time and watching this. If you like it and want future content, by all means, hit that notification, hit the subscribe. If you don't mind hitting that like button. If you really like this one, you'll like one that's coming up. I'm gonna do the same bread, but more advanced, a little bit longer video and using all the technical terms for it. So if you wanna increase your education on bread, just come on back. Thanks again.